Okay. Awesome. All right. So everyone watching, thank you for jumping on. And those that have joined us on this Zoom call, we are going through the Bible. But we're going to do it in a different way. We're going to go from Genesis, the whole book of Genesis, and then we're going to go through Revelation. So it's going to be Genesis, front of the book, front of the Bible, and then behind the back of the book, because Genesis and Revelation are actually similar books. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says, remember the former things, the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Remember what he said, declaring the end, declaring the end from the beginning. That means Genesis gives us a revelation of the end times and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel, this is God speaking, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's important, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. So that is God telling us that as we read the foundations, which is Genesis 1 through 11, the book of Genesis itself, we're going to get an unraveling of the end times. Many people go right to Revelation and other prophetic books, but if we look at Genesis, it will actually give us an understanding of what's happening in our day. Proverbs 11.2 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is important because right now the foundations of our society, which is rooted in a Christian Judeo society of some capacity. Yes, we know that there have been Freemasons that have been um, part of this, the birth of this nation. We know that. We know that Masonic groups have infiltrated governments and Congress. We all know that. But there was a remnant that dedicated this country to God right on the Mayflower ships before they came. It was called the Mayflower Compact. They actually prayed together and came into covenant with each other and with God that they would dedicate the United States. At that time, it was, it was going to be 13 colonies to the Lord Jesus Christ and his will. That's why the United States on record has the most missionaries ever sent out in the world ever sent out the united states is a friend of israel that is not a coincidence but when we start removing the foundations right and we start destroying them we start removing the ten commandments we start removing all these different things from our society that pertain to the lord jesus christ to god himself his commandments morality divine morality we see a nation and we see a society in chaos. That's what we're looking at. So we're going back to the beginning so we can actually understand why we're here in our times now. Very important to do that. We're gonna start the screen share. Remember, we're gonna be doing Genesis, the whole book, all 50 chapters, but then we're going right into Revelation after that, front to back, but then in between, after Revelation, we'll start going through the law of Moses, the Torah, into the historical books, the, pro, the poetic books, the wisdom books, and then on down the line to the minor and major prophets. So we're going to try to be doing this at least three times a week, going through the scriptures, going through the Bible front to cover. We're just doing it a little bit different to understand why we're doing and why we're studying the beginning, Genesis, the book of beginnings, and then going into Revelation. And we're going to see both of these books really come to life. And it's going to give us a view a panoramic view why we are in the times we're living in right now the old foundations the old pathways are being removed so we're going to do our screen share here if you're watching with us for the first time welcome whether on youtube facebook this is the creation narrative the central figure of this book from chapters 12 through 1 through 25 are devoted to one man, that's Abraham. And the preceding chapters deal with Abraham's ancestors. The succeeding chapters deal with his posterity, his children. Thus, the book deals with Abraham, his descent, and his descendants, how God called Abraham. So you're going to be going over that. We're going to be going over this little outline here to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of what we're getting into. 
So chapters 12 through 25, we're going to be dealing with Abraham. Okay. Now, why is this book frequently criticized? Okay. If you can remove the beginning, the creation, the creator himself, that he did not create human beings, that God himself, Elohim himself did not create human beings, you can lead society in whatever direction you want. Man is unrestrained. And that's what we got in our day, unrestrained. We have no restraint in our society now. Henceforth, you see what we have this month where people are actually tempting God's judgment upon this nation and upon the earth. And we have to understand that God is the creator. And there's testimony throughout testimony through the scriptures, Old and New Testament, why God is the creator. Why is, this freak, why is this book frequently criticized? Genesis, Daniel, and Jonah are the favorite targets of the Bible's destructive critics. So you have many people, in semina even in seminary, that come against Genesis, Daniel, Jonah, and say that they're not inspired, and that they're basically myths, that they're mystified, that they are fragmentized, and that they're humanized. Basically, they bring it down to a human level. These higher critics take delight, and they're called higher critics for a reason. These higher critics take delight in humanizing, fragmentizing, and mysticizing the book of Genesis. So if you can bring Genesis down to a human level, then you can say, you can teach, you can say, you can promote what your agenda is. Because if God is not the creator, then it's a book of myths, then you can pass Man can pass his own laws that are flawed by nature. By nature, man is flawed and fallen. And we're going to go into that in this book as well. There's been more commentaries written upon Genesis, the Gospel of John, Romans, and Revelation than upon any other books in the Bible. And we know that Genesis has been heard as a story through infancy of people's Sunday schools and and the beginning of people's lives, usually Genesis, well, not maybe now in this generation, but in other generations, Genesis was read as a book through with, with babies and young adults, toddlers, sitting upon their parents' laps, reading the book of Genesis. That's when our nation was more geared towards the things of God. And we've, we've actually moved away from those foundations. The unity of the book. Contrary to the findings of higher critics, the book is the work of one editor and author, which is Moses, and it is beautifully in unity, each part being essential to the whole. So that word for higher critics are people basically that want to deconstruct the Bible, bring it to a human level. There's also schools that are called uh, the school. There's a school in Germany called the Frankfurt School of Higher Criticism, right? These are, this was a university in Germany during the 19, early 1930s, right before Nazism got his momentum, where they used to bring Lutheran pastors and Lutheran ministers, the Lutheran denomination in Germany was very big, and they would actually train them in higher criticism. And higher criticism is just breaking down the Bible, finding flaws in it, and saying it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we cannot take it at face value. So we don't have to obey it. And that's what happened. And that also actually gave rise to the Nazis and their socialist ideology. It actually caused millions of people to die because once again, when man takes over without restraints, without divine restraints, they will destroy society, eventually murdering. At the end of the day, the devil is a thief. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And when man gets to the point where they're unrestrained, they become murderers. That's why you see Cain and Abel, which we're going to go into in this study, why Cain killed his brother Abel. Unrestraint, jealousy, anger, resentment. And we see that now in our own society. It says here, the book spans a period of around 2,300 years from the morning of, re of creation to the death of Joseph in Egypt. Now, this particular book believes in the gap theory, and we're going to go into that in the next teaching. Uh, I'm not going to go into the gap theory now, but there is a teaching that between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 
and Genesis chapter one, verse two, there was a gap in creation. There was another era of time that we don't really know about. I don't agree with that view. I believe that God has given us the perfect historical book and historical context of what he wants us to know. Remember something that the hidden things belong to God, but the things that revealed are for the children of men. So those things that are revealed are for us. These things are revealed already, but those hidden things are not for us. They're in God's mind. Remember his ways are higher than our ways. And we got to humble ourselves to that. So this particular book that I'm reading from, this author believes in the gap theory. I don't believe in the gap theory as a teacher. I think that the word of God is perfect. It's, it's lined up the way the Lord wanted it to be. So I'm not a gap theorist, but I do believe that there's things that are mysterious to us and we don't fully understand in all things. And we'll probably understand them when we see the Lord in glory. So if you're not a Christian, you want to get with Christ now in this generation, because a lot of things are happening and you're going to see a lot of things. So the book spans four dispensations. These are errors and times. A dispensation is an error in human history, right? The dispensation of innocence, Adam and Eve, before they fell from grace. The dispensation of conscience, the dispensation of human government, and the dispensation of promise. And as we analyze the book's structure, it reveals it has 11 divisions, each division accepting the first, beginning with these are the generations of, right? So there's going to be a lot of generations. We're going to go through some genealogies. Everybody loves genealogies, right? No, a lot of people hate the genealogies in the Bible, but they do reveal that God is a God of generations. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you see him reiterating that through scripture. So God is a God of generations. That's why we speak life into our children. That's why we speak the scriptures to the younger generation. Because if he should tarry, that generation carries the torch of the gospel and the word of God. That's why we have to invest in our generation, the next generation after us. The devil's doing it. You see who he's targeting. That's a strategic attack. He's targeting the children. He's targeting the children. Why? Because they're the next generation. The enemy does not know. The devil and his kingdom, his demons, principalities, powers, fallen angels, they don't know when the Lord is coming back. They don't know. They already know they're judged, that they've lost the battle. They know that their lot and their destiny is the lake of fire in hell. But they can do whatever they can with whatever power they have in this world because the devil owns this world. The whole world lies in the wicked one. Remember that. The whole world system, not the earth, but the world systems lies in the hands of the wicked one, which is another term for the enemy. He is using the world systems to target the children's minds. This is strategic warfare. Hitler did the same thing. That's why I believe Hitler was inspired by a powerful, maybe even fallen angel that might have influenced or maybe possessed him. A high-ranking devil got into Hitler because he said those that win the next generation win the society, win the war. He understood that concept about the next generation. That's why you had the Hitler youth. So he was actually himself following a satanic pattern. And he himself was part of the occult. We can go into that another time. But Hitler himself was part of the occult. So he was getting demonic revelation. And you see what he was doing. His job eventually became just to exterminate the Jewish nation. And that was strategic as well. And we see that here, that in the book of Genesis, it goes into the generations of the heavens and the earth. Right. It goes into the generations of Adam, the generations of Noah, the generations of the sons of Noah, the generations of Shem, which is one of the sons of Noah, and then Abraham's father, Terah, that's Abraham's father. Then you have Ishmael, you have Isaac, that's Abraham's sons. These are Abraham's sons, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. Chapter 25, 12 through 18. We see Isaac 25, 19 through 35, chapter 35. We see Esau come on the scene in chapter 36. And we see the generation of Jacob from chapter 37 through 50. 
All right, so this is a little outline here of what we're going to be getting into in the book of Genesis, 50 chapters, starting with the intro, the introduction, the history of creation, the generation of heaven and earth, the generations of Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem, Terah, which is Abraham's father, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob, which are Abraham's sons. And it is probable that Moses had in his possession 11 historical documents handed down to him from his forefathers and that he himself, led by the Holy Spirit, edited and added words of explanation to these documents and then incorporated them bodily into his Genesis record. In short, Moses probably wrote Genesis by editing and adding words of explanation to the family records in his possession. I also do believe that when Moses went up to the mountain, when he was meeting God to receive the law, the Torah, that also the Lord led him to make some adjustments to Genesis. He showed him other things in the five books, which is the Torah. So I believe that Moses also received revelation when he went up on Mount Horeb to have that meeting with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. Contrary to the findings of the higher critics, the book is the work of one editor, Moses, and many people come against this. This is what you have in seminary, even in seminary. Forget about universities. Most universities do not take creation as a historical book. It is a myth. Even when people are taking religious classes in a university, it's laughable. They actually tear down the Bible. They don't build it up and say this is a historical document. They tear it down. So this is what we have with higher critics in our society. And it says Moses, Moses was the one that unified the book and each part of the book is essential. So what do we have here? The central figure of the book is Abraham. Okay, you have Adam and then you have Abraham. You have Noah in the middle. These are central figures that we're gonna, we're gonna hone in on as we get through the intro. It says here, the purpose of the book is to reveal God's will for Abraham and his seed. God's will for Abraham is that he be the natural father of the redeemer and the spiritual father of the redeemed. The redeemer is Jesus Christ. And we know Abraham is the patriarch of Israel, but he's also our patriarch by faith. Abraham believed by faith. So he is the father of the faithful. We see Abraham as a pagan, answer the call of God, and follow God until the end of his life. God's will for Abraham's seed, which is Christ, the church, and the redeemed Israel, is that through them, all the families of the earth receive blessing, Abraham's blessing, justification by faith. Remember, Abraham preceded the law of Moses, and he was justified by faith. And we see Paul reiterate that in the book of Romans. Those that are justified are justified by faith, not by works, not by the law, but by faith. That is central to the gospel message. No matter how many people want to bring in the Hebrew roots movement, that you got to keep Sabbath, that you, gotta, you, gotta, you can't eat pork, all these things have nothing to do with salvation and the gospel. The gospel comes by faith, you believe by faith, you are saved through grace by faith, not of your own works, that man should boast in his own works. This is what we have now. We see a lot of the Hebrew roots movement coming into the church too, talking about we cannot eat, we cannot touch, we cannot handle, and we have to keep Sabbath. Now, if people want to do that, that's their own conscience. That's up to them, but it's not. It's not. From the standpoint of righteousness, our righteousness is through justification by faith. Our righteousness is through Christ, and we are justified by faith. The historical value of the book gives us the only inspired record of the earth's earliest ages. The book furnishes us a foundation. Once again, we're going back to the foundation for the reminder of the Bible, meaning Without these foundations, the remainder of the Bible is going to be very, very bleak. It's going to be without understanding. It's going to have no essence to it. Genesis is the foundation of the scripture. The word Genesis means the beginnings. 
Without Genesis, you got no gospel. That's it. And that's strategic. Evolution and every other creation story that removes the fall of man, that removes God as the creator, is a demonic doctrine. It's a doctrine of devils. Because without that, you, you do not need a redeemer. You do not need a savior. Jesus came to save us from our sins, from the wrath of God, and provide a way back to the Father. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. That's it, a mediator, a go-between between between God and man. Without Genesis, once you remove Genesis, after that, you need no gospel. And now you are unrestrained and you are lawless. And henceforth, we see that society right now in our day and age, a lawless society. And Jesus did himself prophesy that lawlessness will increase, lawlessness will abound, and the hearts of many will grow cold. The scientific value of Genesis, it's primarily a book on science itself, but its its incidental statements concerning science are in agreement with the verified facts of modern day science. Genesis sometimes disagrees with the scientific theories but never with the scientific facts. Evolution is a theory, not a fact. The literary value, it contains literary masterpieces. It is in itself a literary masterpiece. Its story concerning Joseph is unexcelled. Okay, so this book itself, from a reading standpoint, is a masterpiece. Chapters one through 11, The section deals, this section from one through 11 is called the foundations. This section deals with the roots of all nations, the beginning of creation, all the way to the Tower of Babel, which we're seeing the Tower of Babel being recreated right now in our generation. So chapters one through 11 of Genesis deal with the roots of all nations. Chapters 12 through 50 deals with the root nation, with the root of the nation of Israel, how Israel became a nation. We see that as well. Israel had a destiny. They still do, but they had a destiny before Christ to fulfill a certain mission on earth, but they failed. They failed, but they're going to be redeemed as well. You see, they're going to be redeemed as well. There's There's a destiny for the church, which is the bride of Christ, and there's a destiny for Israel as a nation. So chapters 1 through 11 deals with the roots of all the nations. And the beginning of time in chapters 12 through 50 deals with the nation of Israel. It says here, the trace, I like this here, the trace of the righteous line. And remember, there's a line that leads to Christ. That's why in the two gospels and Luke and Matthew, you have a genealogy. Matthew and Luke were very detailed authors. See, God used their personalities, their giftings through the Holy Spirit to create and write this gospel in detail. Their gospels are very detailed. Matthew and Luke are detailed gospels. That's why they give you the genealogy in the beginning to show you the line of Christ, to show you that Christ comes from the line of the Messiah, the promised line. So it says the genealogies of some collateral lines are given, but only as they affect the righteous line. A collateral line means some genealogies go off, but they lead all the way back to the Messiah. The collateral lines are first. They trace the collateral lines first, The genealogies of the branches always precede those of the main line, the righteous line. For example, the genealogy of Cain precedes that of Seth. That of Ishmael precedes that of Isaac. That of Esau precedes that of Jacob, and et cetera. So you see how these genealogies are collateral. They're on the side, but then they lead back right to the Messiah. And you see how the the lines are important. Genealogies are very boring to people. I understand. I don't like reading them too much myself, but they are important. They give you, they grant you revelation into how the Lord dealt with people, their families, their lineages. And I do believe that when we get saved, and if we're first, if we're one of the first ones in our families to get saved, look back on your genealogy, starting from you back, right? If you can, think about it for one second. That's how you can get understanding of your generation. If there were idolaters, if they practiced witchcraft, if there was certain things in your family that failed, all these things go back 
And yes, God redeemed us. Jesus redeemed us from the curse. But we got to take authority and enforce that victory even through our generational line because that can affect us now. If we're the first ones, if we're the first in our generational line, we got to look back and say, what was my family like? You see, the families and the generations are very important. And people want to negate that. They want to refute the fact that there's no such things as a generational curse or there's, once you get saved, that's it. You're redeemed from the curse. Absolutely, I agree. But it doesn't mean that you don't enforce the genial or, or the generations before you because that can affect you and hinder you now. Because those are those are spirits that operate through a family line. And you see that if that pattern play out even in the book of Genesis and throughout the scriptures, Esau's line, right? You see Esau's line, they became Esau's nation, the nation of the Edomites. They became hostile and contrary to God's people, eventually being judged. They dwelt in a land called Mount Seir. That's in the Old Testament during the prophetic books. We'll see that. Esau's line followed after a way of becoming contrary to God's line, which was in the line of Jacob, and eventually meeting God's judgment. That line was on its way to judgment, not even knowing. They thought that they, they were always contrary to the line of Jacob, even up to the last point when they were judged. And we got to be careful with that. We have to pray. We, ask, we have to ask the Lord for revelation and understanding in these areas. And these are deeper spiritual mysteries that are backed up with scripture. This is not something that is a, a, of, of mystical proportion. And it says here, the historical book. Genesis is a historical book. We have previously mentioned this fact. The first 11 chapters gives us a fragmentary history. The remaining chapters give us a detailed history. Chronological, its history carries us chronologically with a few exceptions from Adam to Joseph. It is a condensed book. As a whole, the book is an acorn out of which the oak tree of the remainder of the Bible grows. It's a seedbed. The books enfold doctrines, prophecies, and promises that are unfolded in the remainder of the Bible's books. So you have doctrines, prophecies, and promises. We were doing a teaching a few weeks back about the keys to victorious Christians living, where we dealt with doctrines, prophecies, and promises. The book of Genesis, this one book, 50 chapters, has all of it in one. This one book in the Bible, in Genesis, has prophecies, promises, and doctrines, and they're still being unfolded. In the remainder of the Bible's books, the book's beginnings are developed in the following 65 books. This book is the foundation of the rest of the 65 books of the Bible. It is a religious book. Although the book is a historical book, a biographical book, and a, science, and a, scienti a scientific book, it is primarily a religious book, a book with a religious purpose. The book reveals God's plan of redemption through Abraham for the whole human race, for the whole human race. It is an interesting book. No one accuses this portion of the Bible with being dull. It commands attention throughout its pages. So this is the outline here. The beginning of all nations, chapter 1 through 11. The two records of creation, which is one record of creation, chapter 1 and 2. The fall of man, chapter 3. Cain and Abel, chapter 4, 1 through 15. The two lines of Adam. To the flood. Remember, you got two lines, the lines of Cain, the lines of Seth, chapter four through five. You have the destruction of the old world, the deluge, the flood of Noah, the antediluvian age. That's what they call that era, the antediluvian age. That is the era right before the flood. It's called the antediluvian age. That's chapter six through eight. You got the start after the flood, the new covenant that God enters in with Noah and his family, chapters eight through nine. The Table of Nations, that's the Tower of Babel, chapter 10. And you have the scattering of the nations, that's a judgment. God judged the nations at Babel by scattering them. And that's how you get different nations. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, the background of Abraham, 11, 10 through 32. Then you have the beginning of the nation of Israel, very important. Chapters 12 through 50, the story of Abraham is chapter 12, all the way to 25, the story of Isaac. 25 through 26, 
and the story of Jacob, 27 through 36. The story of Joseph, which leaves the Hebrews in Egypt, and you see Moses in the book of Exodus called up as a deliverer, and that is chapters 37 through 50, 37 through 50. Praise God. Genesis is one of the books we should be chewing on, especially in our generation. And it says here, we're going to scroll down here. It says, having made mention of the truthfulness of this account, this has to do with evolution in the Bible. Let us say a brief word about evolution. Let's pay attention here. Note that evolution, the evolutionary hypothesis, that's what it is. It's a theory. It's a hypothesis. It's simply that, a hypothesis, not scientific fact. Because of the time that has elapsed from the beginning of time and today, no hypothesis of the origins of the world can be properly tested, much less proven. So all these things are theories. Evolutionary theory is not fact. So though many around us are enamored of the evolutionary hypothesis, let us not get carried away by the accusations claiming the Bible contradicts proven science. The Bible does not contradict proven science. For not only can the evolutionary process or hypothesis not be scientifically, scientifically tested or proven, it also cannot by any reasonable means, be partnered with the biblical creation account. Notice these three reasons why. First, we are given no reason to believe that the six days of creation were not six literal days. This is very important. Before we even start the reading of Genesis, we got to understand the creation happened in literal days, 24-hour periods. Yes, with the Lord's one day, is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. That's in Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. But Genesis says, Genesis one says again and again that on each day, uh, excuse me, on each day, there was evening and there was morning. That makes it a 24 hour period. It's not talking about thousands of years because Peter in second Peter verses uh, eight, chapter three, it does not talk about thousands of years. It's giving you a metaphor. Peter's not using that to give us a new timetable to try to figure out creation's time. The Bible itself, Genesis itself, chapter one, gives us the actual time frame when each day was created. That is automatic. It says here, that doesn't describe a millennium, but the normal sequence of one 24-hour day. So we see again, Genesis 1 says again and again that each day there was evening and there was morning. That doesn't describe a thousand years, which is a millennium, but the normal sequence of what? 24 hour days. That's it. That is the creation each day. We're going to go into that word study too when we talk about what a day is in Hebrew. Second, notice that the Bible makes it clear that the plants, the sea creatures, the birds, the mammals, and the reptiles were created after their kind. So what are we being told is this? What we're being told is this. God did not create an, am an amoeba and turned it into a fish, nor did he create a monkey that evolved into a modern man. I want to read that again. God did not create an amoeba that turned into a fish, nor did he create a monkey that evolved into a modern man. Each creature was created as a distinct kind. Very important. This puts evolutionary thinking, it basically strikes it down. God created each creature, each plant after its own kind. It did not evolve. Evolution has even crept into the church and into certain seminaries. They try to mesh it together, which basically you have to jumble the, you have to jumble the Bible. You have to jumble and jumble the words and, and take its words out of context, pull it apart, and then try to bring it together with evolutionary doctrine and biblical doctrine of creation. Third, notice that man was created in the image of God. Let I want to be very clear about this. Man was created in the image of God, not in the image of anything else, not in the image of an alien, not in the image of a monkey, not in the image of any other creature. 
but the image of God. There's a deception that's being bubbled up in our society and we're being soft walked. We're being walked forward softly. I call it a soft disclosure that aliens exist and that they are our, that we're their progenitors, meaning they created us. That all religions, including the gospel, comes from them because all quote unquote God doctrines, if you want to call it that, the doctrines of God, whether it's Christ, Buddha, Confucius, Hare Krishna, Muhammad, Allah, whatever you want to call it, but all these religions that they originated through these alien beings that are coming. We're being softly walked forward to believe that. Why? Because we have an evolutionary thinking. Most of society believes in evolution now. They do not believe as God as the creator. And God created man in his own image. That's why Jesus came as a man, a human being. He didn't come as a hybrid, half alien and half man. He came as a man. He shed his blood as a man for the redemption of sins as the perfect sacrifice for me and you. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Not one is righteous or have turned away from seeking God. Not one is good. So man needs a redeemer, a mediator. That's why Jesus came as a man. Don't be deceived. As the Lord said, in the last days, deception is going to be on an all-time rise. Do not be deceived. Know that Jesus came as a man for you personally, as a human being, to get you back into the relationship with you and the Father, with you and the triune God, that your destiny may be lived through that. Everything else is a lie right now. Deception is everywhere. You got people are going to fall away from the Christian faith, believing that these quote unquote alien beings are God and we're their progenitors. They created us. That is a lie. Do not believe that. I'm warning you early. We're early in this. We're early in this walk. They're walking us up little by little. They're walking us up to a certain point. And then the door is going to be open. They're walking us up to the cliff and then they're going to push us off. We're in a soft disclosure moment, soft disclosure. Soon it's going to be a hard disclosure where I believe that these demonic beings, that's what they are. They're a different classification of demons. They're going to actually appear in human form. Remember, God created mankind in his own image, male and female. He created them. Anything that distorts the image of God is demonic. The movements of transgenderism and LGBTQIA plus is all demonic. I'm not talking about the people. The people need to understand that God loves them, that yet while they were still sinners, Christ died for them. So this has nothing to do with personally attacking people. It is what is being lived out in the lives of people. It's the deception. Yet while we were still sinners, God showed his love that he allowed his only begotten son to die for us. And that goes for anybody in any sin. The only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. You cannot get forgiven if you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That's the only sin that you cannot be forgiven of. That is actually recorded in the Bible itself, but any other sin can you be redeemed? You can be redeemed from. We have to remember that God created man in his own image. He created male and female, and he told them be fruitful and multiply. And that is just one aspect of union, husband and wife, man and woman coming together. Everything else that distorts that image is a demonic program. It's a demonic agenda. Anyone then, we'll continue reading here, anyone then who says that we came from the apes must also be prepared to say that God in whose image we are made must be like an ape. That's, that's staggering right there. Anyone that says that we came from apes and primates must also be prepared to say that God in whose image we are made must be like an ape or a primate. Or at least that God must have made ape-like people when he created Adam. So he didn't create Adam. He made an ape first, and then he let it evolve. 
That is ridiculous. Maybe he's evolving too. Do you see evolution at its best is silliness. Man, Adam, with godlike characteristics such as speech, reason, creativity, and moral conscience. Remember something. Man, which was Adam. That's what Adam, Adam's name means Adam, which is man, earth, earthborn. Adam, with godlike characteristics such as speech, reason, creativity, and moral consciousness was created in man's, excuse me, in God's image. Man was made from the beginning in the image of God. That's it. God has what? Speech. The word of God made the heavens and the earth. We have reason. We have creativity. God is a creator. And we have a moral conscience. But that's why it says in the last days, those are people are going to sear their conscience. It's going to be cut off. It's going to be cut off. Man was made from the beginning in the image of God. This is very important. And we'll finish up with this paragraph here. Having created Adam in his own image, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. The Garden of Eden was specially designed with Adam in mind. It was a home perfectly suited to Adam's needs and capabilities. A reminder that it is a kind of, it is kind and loving. It's a kind of loving God with whom we have to do. So the Garden of Eden was specifically made for Adam and his capabilities. Think about the goodness of the home God provided for Adam. Eden was a bountiful land situated on a river delta where the soil would have been rich and black, that in the cotton fields of northwest Mississippi. It's an example. It was covered with the most beautiful orchids and the most sumptuous fruits, apples, oranges, kiwis, plums, peaches, all growing in Adam's backyard. And the surrounding territory was rich in natural resources. Gold and onyx for beauty, aromatic gum, which is bedulum, for creativity and industry. Imagine a landscape unspoiled by human progress, unlimited by climatic conditions, and untainted by sin's curse. When God pronounced a curse on Adam for his sin, the fall from grace, creation also was cursed. The Bible says that creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. Because it was what? It was put in bondage because of the curse, which was sin in the beginning. This is what we're going to get into. We're going to try to be method as methodically as possible. We're going to see other New Testament verses confirm the Genesis account. Jesus himself referred to creation. He made the male and female. They asked him about divorce and remarriage. He went right back to Genesis. He didn't go, not even to the Torah, as in the law per se. He went right back to the creation account. He made them. God made them male and female. So we're going to see in New Testament verses throughout the Bible how Genesis is confirmed. Remember, this right now in our society, if you're watching, is being destroyed. As the word says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? They're destroying the foundations of the creation account as God, as a creator, and who, his, who he is, his essence, how he has made mankind in his own image to the point that they're saying that we've evolved into apes, or apes to human beings, that we have an evol evolutionary type of creation, or that we come from astrobiology, which is aliens and those from quote unquote another planet, which is not true. Do not be deceived. The foundations will keep you from deception. The foundations will keep you from deceptions. And we'll close with these last two verses. This is God declaring himself. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, 
for I am God and there is no other like me. I am God and there is no other. Declaring the end from the beginning, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel, God's counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Rest assured that God's counsel is gonna stand. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word, as Jesus says, my word is eternal. Know that we gotta get back to the foundations in our life. If you're not in Christ, we beseech you and we call out to you by God's mercy, fall under the headship of Christ, get saved, be delivered. It says that if you call out his name, if you declare that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead and you believe, you shall be saved. If you repent of your sins, that means change your mind, but also change your direction, change your ways, change your mind and change your ways. The changing of mind is going to change your ways. You are walking north, you're going to be walking south. You're going to do a turnaround, not a 360, but a 180 and turn to Jesus Christ and follow him as he is calling many now in this generation. If you are not saved, if you know that you're not saved and you're not following Jesus Christ, repent, turn from your sins and follow Jesus Christ. Make that change, follow the master, follow your creator. He is your creator, not an alien race, quote unquote, because they're not aliens from another planet, not animals, not primates. You are not a beast. Human beings are not a beast. We're not beast. We can become like beast when we are inhabited by other spirits and when we have rejected God as our creator and we become reprobates. That's when we become like beast. So we call out to you as a ministry, as one doing this message. If you're not saved, get saved. Turn to Jesus Christ. Follow him. We're going to be going through the book of Genesis for the next couple of weeks. We're going to try to do this three times a week, line by line, precept upon precept, here, here, here a little, there a little. Follow us. Let the truth expand in you. Let God's word be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path in this generation that is in darkness. And we will bless you for it. He will bless you for it. And we can bless him together for he is worthy to be praised. I just want to close out in prayer and we will move on to next week. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this time, Lord. And we ask you, Father God, that your word go forth with revelation and understanding that we are in the last times and that you are still revealing yourself to people. Your arm is never too short to save. We ask you today, Father God, to be with us to grant us understanding, grant us the grace, Lord God, to hear the voice, your voice calling out to us. For many are called, but few are chosen. Lord God, we thank you today for your word that you have not left, left us destitute. You haven't left us orphans. You are a good father. So today, Lord, we lift up your holy name, Jesus, and we ask you to grant us understanding. Expand the borders of our minds and hearts to receive your word. Let this study, Lord God, touch many people around the world. Let the airwaves bring it forward, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We see each other. We see each other either tomorrow or next week. We're going to try to work this through as many days as possible to get the word of God in us throughout our generation. If you're on YouTube, or on Facebook watching us. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.